Welcome, everyone. I'm Terry Austin, and you're watching Law and Crime. Today, we expect Joseph James D'Angelo, also known as the Golden State Killer, to be sentenced by Judge Michael Bowman to 11 consecutive life sentences. He will read a lengthy statement, we believe, perhaps incorporating some of the powerful victim impact statements made by survivors and their families over the past three days. D'Angelo pled guilty to 13 counts of murder and was involved in over 50 rapes and 100 burglaries. We have the live feed. Let's go to court now. The matter of the people of the state of California versus Joseph James D'Angelo, that's case 18FE008017. The matter is on calendar here today for imposition and judgment and sentence. Mr. D'Angelo is present. Can I have defense counsel please state their names for the record? Thank you, counsel. Can I have the people of the state of California also announce their presence? Good morning, Your Honor. Anne Marie Schubert, District Attorney, Sacramento County, for the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Greg Totten, District Attorney of Ventura County, for the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Todd Spitzer, Orange County, District Attorney, for the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Dinah Becton, Contra Costa County, District Attorney, for the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Joyce Dudley, for the people of Santa Barbara County. Good morning, Your Honor. Tim Ward, Tulare County District Attorney for the People. Good morning, Your Honor. Nancy O'Malley, Alameda County District Attorney for the People. Good morning, Your Honor. Tori Verver Salazar on behalf of the People of San Joaquin County for the great state of California. All right, thank you very much. So at this time, I'm going to um, let me ask Mr. Kress, do you waive formal arraignment for judgment and sentence? All right, I'm going to arraign Mr. Uh, D'Angelo on the charges post plea on June 29th, 2020. The defendant entered a plea of guilty to the following crimes. Count one, charge of murder of Quad Snelling, which occurred on September 11th, 1975, in the County of Tulare, a violation of Penal Code Section 187, Prene, murder in the first degree. In addition, the defendant admitted that he personally used a firearm in the course of that murder, a violation of Penal Code Section 12022.5. Count two, the charge of murder in the first degree of Katie Majori, which occurred on February 2nd, 1978, in the County of Sacramento. In addition, the defendant admitted that he personally used a firearm in the course of that murder, in violation of Penal Code Section 12022.5. Count three, the charge of murder in the first degree of Brian Majori which occurred on February 2nd, 1978, in the County of Sacramento. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a firearm in the course of that murder, a violation of Penal Code Section 12022.5. Count four, the charge of murder in the first degree of Deborah Manning, which occurred December 30th, 1979, in the County of Santa Barbara. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a firearm in the course of that murder, a violation of Penal Code Section 12022.5. In addition, the defendant admitted the special circumstance to that murder of Deborah Manning and that the murder was committed in the commission of a rape within the mean of Penal Code Section 261 and pursuant to Penal Code Section 190.2, paren C, paren 3, paren 3. In addition, the defendant admitted the special circumstance that the murder of Deborah Manning was committed in the commission of a burglary within the meaning of Penal Code Section 459 and a violation of Penal Code Section 190.2, paren C, paren 3, paren 5, count 5, the charge of murder in the first degree of Robert Offerman, which occurred on December 30th, 1979, in the County of Santa Barbara. In addition, the defendant admitted that he personally used a firearm in the course of that murder, a violation of Penal Code Section 1222.5, so that's Judge Bowman. We are listening. I'm going to introduce my guests. We have our very own Aaron Keller, and we have also with us Leslie, um, sorry, forgot your last name that quickly, Ricard Chambers. And Leslie, you yes, are from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I'm going to ask you, we know now that the death penalty is not at issue here. He's going to get, we believe, 11 consecutive life sentences. What's the status of the death penalty there in Louisiana? 
Well, right now, the death penalty is on a moratorium, um, and we have not uh, had an execution since 2010. Um, as a matter of fact, the individual who was executed at that time was a known serial um, killer, serial uh, rapist, and he pled guilty and actually waived all of his appeal rights. And so he did not fight the, uh, the challenge of, of being executed. Um, but since that time, uh, the pharmaceutical companies um, in which Louisiana, uh, the Department of Corrections of Louisiana would have contracted with, those pharmaceutical companies have said that they would not supply uh, the state of Louisiana with any uh, medication, if you will, to um, assist with the performing or the execution of these uh, death sentences. And so right now we're at a standstill here. Right, exactly. You know, it's interesting, even though 30 states have the death penalty, so many of them are on a moratorium. Aaron Keller, let me ask you, we know for a fact that in California, the judge, the uh, governor, Gavin, has put a moratorium on the death penalty there as well. We know also that some of these victims have said they think that, you know, Joseph D'Angelo should be put to death. What's your view about the death penalty out in California? Well, basically, the governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, has said uh, no executions while I'm in office. He did that by executive order dating back to March 2019. It's interesting because the voters in that state have uh, recently, about uh, two or three years ago, had a chance to uh, yet again weigh in on the death penalty in that state. They said that they were still for it uh, by uh, what I recall to be a relatively narrow margin. Uh, Governor Newsom cited human error as one of the reasons he didn't want this final solution uh, being uh, carried out in the justice system. He also said that, in his view, there was no public benefit at, or value to the death penalty as a deterrent for crime. So those are the governor's views, uh, the views of the people uh, weighing just slightly against the governor there. Uh, bottom line, about 730 death row inmates in California back in March of last year when he signed that order. Uh, and uh, on we go with it. So uh, the bottom line is with a, a track record like the Golden State Killers, uh, a lot of people out there watching certainly saying, hey, look, if there ought to be a death penalty, it should be for someone like him. Uh, but because of the governor's order, there's not a chance of that. Even if it is handed out, it would not be effectuated, at least while Governor Newsom is in office. Yeah, that's exactly right, Aaron. Let's go back to court and listen to what Judge Bowman is doing. He's reading off the charges. This is the Joseph D'Angelo case. Circumstance that the murder of Patrice Harrington was committed in the commission of a burglary within the meaning of Penal Code Section 459 and Penal Code Section 190.2, print A, print 17, print 7. Count 11, the charge of murder in the first degree of Keith Harrington, which occurred on August 21st, 1980, in the county of Orange. In addition, the defendant admitted the special circumstance of the murder of Keith Harrington, that the murder was committed in the commission of a burglary within the mean of Penal Code Section 459 and Penal Code Section 190.2, print A, print 17, print 7. Count 12, charge of murder in the first degree of Manuela Whitnew, which occurred on February 6th, 1981, in the county of Orange. In addition, the defendant admitted the special circumstance to the murder of Manuela Wittenu and that the murder was committed in the commission of a rape within the mean of Penal Code Section 261 and Penal Code Section 190.2, Paren C, Paren 17, Paren 3. In addition, the defendant admitted the special circumstance that the murder of Manuela Wittenu was committed in the commission of a burglary. Within the, within the mean of Penal Code Section 459 and a violation of Penal Code Section 190.2, print A, print 17, print 7. Count 13, the charge of murder in the first degree of Janelle Cruz, which occurred May 5th, 1986, in the County of Orange. In addition, the defendant admitted the special circumstance that the murder of Janelle Cruz and that the murder was committed in the commission of a rape within the mean of Penal Code Section 261 and pursuant to Penal Code Section 190.2, paren C, paren 17, paren 3. In addition, the defendant admitted the special circumstance that the murder of Janelle Cruz was committed in the commission of a burglary within the mean of Penal Code Section 459 and a violation of Penal Code Section 190.2, paren A, paren 17, paren 7. 
In addition, the defendant admitted that he did commit multiple murders within the mean penal code section 190.2 paren a paren 3 and penal code section 190.2 paren c paren 7 in counts 2 through 13. Count 14, the charge of kidnapping with intent to commit robbery of Jane Doe number one having occurred on September 4th. 1976 in the County of Sacramento, a violation of penal code section 209. In addition, the defendant admitted that he personally used a knife in the course of that robbery, a violation of penal code section 12022, count 15. Charge of kidnap and intent to commit robbery of Jane Doe number two, having occurred on April 2nd, 1977 in the County of Sacramento, a violation of penal code section 209. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a firearm in the course of that robbery in violation of Penal Code Section 1222.5. Count 16, charge of kidnapping with intent to commit robbery of Jane Doe number three, having occurred April 15th, 1977, in the County of Sacramento, a violation of Penal Code Section 209. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a firearm in the course of that robbery, a violation of Penal Code Section 1222.5. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a knife in the commission of that robbery, a violation of Penal Code Section 1222. Count 17, the charge of kidnapping with intent to commit robbery of Jane Doe number four having occurred May 3rd, 1977 in the County of Sacramento, a violation of Penal Code Section 209. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a firearm in the course of that robbery, a violation of Penal Code Section 1222.5. Count 18, the charge of kidnapping with intent to commit robbery of Jane Doe number five, having occurred May 14, 1977, in the County of Sacramento, a violation of Penal Code Section 209. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a firearm in the course of that robbery, a violation of Penal Code Section 1222.5. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a knife in the course of that robbery, a violation of Penal Code Section 1222. Count 19, charge of kidnapping with intent to commit robbery of Jane Doe number six, having occurred May 17, 1977, in the county of Sacramento, a violation of Penal Code Section 209. In addition, the defendant admitted he personally used a firearm in the course of that robbery, a violation of Penal Code Section 1222.5. You are listening to the judge in the Golden State Killer case. He is reading all of the counts against Joseph D'Angelo. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we will listen more live to what the judge has to say. We are live at the sentencing of Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer. The judge just read off the multiple charges against him, and now the attorney for the county of Contra Costa is talking about the sentencing. Let's go live and hear what she had to say. All of us, the pain and the agony that they have do endured over the years. After today's sentencing, Mr. D'Angelo will never threaten our victims again. He will never harm another soul. His evil actions are hard to describe and recount. The victims in this case briefly, bravely told the court this week the lasting trauma and pain caused by D'Angelo's horrific actions. As a former Superior Court judge myself, hearing from victims during the sentencing phase of a case is powerful and very sobering. Those whose lives were forever changed deserved a day in court. And I want to thank the court for allowing each victim who had the courage and the determination to come forward, allowing them to the time to speak. We appreciate the opportunity for their voices to be heard. Thank you, Your Honor. Let us not forget the important words this week from these men and women and their families. Their words were hard to listen to due to the depravity displayed by Mr. D'Angelo, who preyed upon these victims. I appreciate the courage that it took to come forward. Just emphasizing a few statements from our victims in Contra Costa County, one said, I survived and thrived because of the love and the support of friends and family, for which I can never thank them enough. 
Now, here we are, all strong women, not victims, having our say to a madman. Another said, finally, I can go forward. I have the justice I have been waiting so long for. I never thought I would get it. And last but not least, one said, we are committed and determined not to let these hours in October 1978 define who we are and what we were to become. I am so encouraged to hear that by finally seeing justice served, our victims now have hope. They have hope for a future. The criminal justice system is often complex, long-winded, and slow. In this case, for decades, D'Angelo eluded capture. However, thanks to the task force under Sacramento District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert, he was brought into custody. Law enforcement officials never gave up hope that we could bring the Golden State State Killer to justice. The history in this case and the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office history is tied to our former cold case investigator, Paul Hole. Mr. Hole spent decades, much of his career, and he played a tremendous role in solving this case and bringing us to this day of reckoning. I want to express my gratitude for Paul Hole's tireless work on this case on behalf of the victims across the state of California. The entire prosecution team spent countless hours to bring this case to a resolution and to assist the victims throughout this entire process, including our victim witness advocates and our attorneys. And I thank the team for the important work that you have done to bring this case to an end. The crimes spanned over 13 years that we know of. The seriousness and the gravity of the offenses, the psychological harm, the pain and the brutality of these offenses requires nothing less than the imposition of the maximum sentence. The victims must be assured that Mr. D'Angelo will never, ever walk this earth again as a free man. Your Honor, I stand for the people to respectfully thank the court for imposing the maximum amount of time allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Did the uh, district attorney from Orange County wish to be heard? Good morning, Your Honor. If it pleases the court, I cannot thank you enough on behalf of the people of Orange County and the people of the state of California for your grace and your patience, Your Honor. You have been amazing, and I know everybody in this room agrees just how much you have allowed us so much leeway uh, and courtesy during these proceedings. I just wanted to publicly acknowledge you and thank you. Thank you, sir. I also would like to thank my team, um, Debbie Lloyd, Dennis Conway, Pat Dixon, Investigator Hutchcraft, Investigator Doyle, Law Clerk Rebecca Malkin, and of course, I wanna thank Anne Marie and her team. And I wanna acknowledge your honor in public that just the amazing work of the district attorneys who work collaboratively to bring this case to justice. Many people don't know there's two interesting things about a case where a death penalty is on the line. One is that is a decision of the elected district attorneys and no one else. And in California, the only sentence that's handed down by a jury is death. Yesterday marked 40 years to the date that a stranger walked into Patty and Keith Harrington's Dana Point home and robbed those three month newlyweds of their life. Yesterday, the day the two brothers testified about their youngest brother, Keith. They never made it to their first wedding anniversary. Manuela Whitton spent 28 short years on this earth, never knowing the joy of motherhood. And you heard yesterday that her surviving husband never lead an appropriate life after death, until he died. Janelle Cruz, 18 years old, life was ended before she realized her dreams 
<clears throat> of graduating from college or picking out a wedding dress. Natural things we all live for in our lives. For the last three days, we heard about the 13 lives that were cut short through murder. We heard of the memories that were never made. We heard of the dozens and dozens of sexual assault victims who had to go through that depraved act while some of their husbands watched which is beyond comprehension for me. As he was destroying your lives, he got to be on his boat, blow out birthday candles, hold his granddaughter, but all the time in the back of his mind, he knew, he knew we would get. Sir, in 2006, when I was the chairman of the committee that oversaw state prisons in the state assembly for the state of California, I watched the last man executed in the San Quentin death chamber. I was a witness to that death. When I was elected district attorney and this case became mine on behalf of the Orange County citizens, I wanted one thing. I wanted to wait those 25 years. And when I was at 85 or beyond, depending on how long it took for you to appeal your death sentence, I wanted them to wheel me in on my wheelchair. And instead of just staring straight forward in some glazed over eyes, I wanted to stare at you and watch you silently slip into the night. Never again to take away anybody's dreams that you ruined and the nightmares you created. I wanted to watch that. You made it personal and it was personal for me on behalf of all these people. I honestly believe that this person, not even a person, this beast deserved the ultimate punishment of death. But we met with our victims we knew the age of the case. We knew how long it took to solve. And we knew that this was the right thing to do so you could all be here today in your lifetime as long as you had this opportunity. Today, this event today is a sentencing. Early in the week was a celebration of life on behalf of the victim. But today is a sentence. And it's meant for the victims who are silently now in heaven or those of you who, thank God, are still here on earth, who now can become free from the shackles that you have been forced to endure since your paths intersected with the devil. Today, it's the devil. That's the prosecutor for Orange County, where there were at least two deaths, and he's talking about the importance of sentencing. Leslie, as a prosecutor, what are your thoughts about this entire process? We've waited years. We finally see that D'Angelo has pled guilty, and we heard the victims and their impact statements, and now it's time for the sentencing. How important is what each of these prosecutors is saying at this point? It's, it's beyond important, Terry. I, I think that people don't always realize that the prosecutors who pursue these types of cases they are so profoundly just committed to ensuring that justice happens, especially in a case like this. And both prosecutors who have spoken so far have clearly been able to articulate the, their investment in securing justice for not just these victims, but to the families, to the state, um, to everyone who has even um, be become aware of the monstrous uh, things that this defendant has done. And, and so I think that it is quite um, 
reassuring. I think that the, that the public feels somewhat reassured when they see their prosecutorial leaders um, not just put the onus, um, if you will, or, or just make the victims do the job of giving these victims impact statements, but also to have their prosecutorial leaders get up to say, you didn't just hurt these victims, you hurt all of us. And we're going to make sure that whatever penalty is afforded to you, that it's handed down to you. And, you know, this is their, this is, this is the leader's way of showing these victims that they are um, in this together and they're working side by side to make sure justice is done. Well said, well said, Leslie. Aaron, let me ask you before we run back to court, because it looks like another prosecutor is there. The Orange County prosecutor said something about the death penalty. It seems as though he might have been a little bit conflicted just because this is, as you said earlier, the person who should be subject to the death penalty. Do you agree? Well, I didn't want to put my personal opinion into it. I, I was just saying that for those who agree with the death penalty, I, I don't like to give my personal opinion about it. But for those who do agree with it, this is the case, the type of case they point to. They point to someone who has a crime spree stretching from 1973 to 1986 and saying this is why we have the death penalty is to send a message that, that we just don't tolerate this kind of a conduct. Um, and, and I think the prosecutor was using a, a, a bit of the pulpit there to turn around and say, hey, look, I need to remind everybody just exactly what role I play in this. This is my piece of this, but there are all the other pieces of this justice system. I, I took it as a bit of an education moment. Right. I think he took his chance. Before we go back to court, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be live in the sentencing of the Golden State Killer. Welcome back. We are live at the sentencing of the Golden State Killer out in California. We've heard from the judge. He's read the charges. We've also heard from the prosecutors from Contra Costa County, Orange County, Santa Barbara County. Let's go back live and listen to what they had to say. Counsel. With the district attorney representing Tulare County, wish to be heard at this time. Good morning, Tim Ward, Tulare County District Attorney. Your Honor, when your gavel falls today, this sentence will be final. And this case will soon then be viewed through the prism of history. And as we have seen and heard this week, the defendant slowly ceases to be the focal point of that story. Instead, my prayer going forward is the legacy which remains will focus on the triumph and the resiliency displayed by the survivors that we've heard from this week. Though questions will inevitably remain, we should continue to be steadfastly focused on the compassion justly due these families assembled here today. Though these despicable horrors began in Tulare County, we will not be defined by evil. Instead, our entire community stands silently alongside the Snelling, the Hupp, the McGowan families, and all families here today and families across this state. In searching for some positive message to remain, I say this. The triumphant spirit of these families loudly cries across this state and across the entire world in one unified single voice, crying out to other families who have been victimized, yet they patiently, agonizingly await their day in court. In that unified voice, the world is now told, never give up, you are not forgotten. Like many families that we've heard from this week, others across this nation are living a never-ending nightmarish journey, a journey of continually closed doors. Today, they are shown and they are told, never give up hope. As science and technology evolve, 
the space for evil like this to operate within gets smaller and smaller. Simply put, the DNA will never forget. And by God's grace, may the doors of justice open for other families. That voice of hope is the true legacy that shall remain, and it shall not be silent, ever. On behalf of the Snelling, the Hub, the McGowan families, the Visalia Police Department, and the entire Tulare County community, Your Honor, I want to thank you for providing a model of judicial decorum that has shown remarkable deference to the families and the survivors this week. You have given the state a glimpse into why we have a system of justice in the first place, and that is to serve victims. You have allowed their voices to resonate so loudly, and you have provided a model that other courts would do well to emulate. Thank you, sir. As District Attorney of Tulare County, As District Attorney of Tulare County, it is my honor to speak on behalf of the victims and survivors listed in count one of the complaint and give voice to Professor Snelling and Officer McGowan who cannot do so today. But with their voice, I hereby ask you, Your Honor, to sentence this defendant to the maximum allowed under the law. Thank you, sir. Does the District Attorney representing Ventura County wish to be heard? Good morning, Your Honor. I too want to thank you for the courtesy and kindness you so graciously extended to each of the victims over the last four days. Your Honor, as we have witnessed during these victim impact statements, this is a case about light and darkness. The victims and survivors who testified before this court are people of light. By their courage, they have shined a very bright light on the magnitude of the crimes before this court. It painted a picture of the immense impact these horrific crimes had on their lives. In a sense, they have also brought to life their loved ones. In doing so, they have honored their memories as people of purpose, people of character, people that would have made a difference in this world were it not for the, their brutal murder at the hands of the defendant who today, thank goodness, at last faces judgment. And in their statements, the victims and survivors also revealed to us the fundamental goodness of the human spirit and its will to endure, to thrive, even in the face of unspeakable suffering and loss. We must also confront the terrible darkness of the defendant who sits before this court today, stoic, devoid of humanity, lacking any remorse, and utterly unredeemable. And it is telling that his behavior, both during the crimes and since his arrest, reveals a person who consciously, who willfully, who intentionally avoids the light. His crimes were always committed in the dark of night. And it was common for him to cover lights, to cover furnishings, to cover television sites, televisions, to avoid any ambient light. And even now, here in this courtroom, he turns away from the light 
and dare not face this has been an eventful sentencing so far. And one of the things I have to ask, and Leslie, I'll ask you this question. Did you hear the applause after the attorney for Tulare, Tim Ward, said something about the judge? He said that the judge has been very patient and that the judge has been really a model judge. And then there was a noise, and he turned and he looked behind, and then there was a louder noise. That was applause. Did you hear that as well? And do you think it was for the judge? I, I think that I did hear it, um, Terry. And I, I think that, yes, of course, it was to acknowledge the fact that the judge, how he ha has handled this entire um, process, particularly in the wake of COVID, in the wake of the number of victims who were able to um, be afforded the opportunity to give their victim impact statements. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure, Terry, that you've seen across the country in a lot of cases going on, big and small, that we don't really see a lot of this um, happening in a lot of ca uh, court cases because uh, COVID has put a, uh, a lot of, um, it, it stopped a lot of this, right? And so, you know, this judge, I, I, I see that the court is holding court, it looks like in a ballroom of maybe a, a hotel of some sorts. Um, and and I, I, I think that this shows the, the judge's dedication to ensuring that these victims, while they have had to have the, a delay in justice for so long, that he right. wouldn't be a part of that um, just because we have the challenge of COVID in this country. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we will live in the sentencing of Joseph D'Angelo. Welcome back, everyone. We are live in the sentencing of Joseph D'Angelo out in California. Before we go back to court, Aaron, you just heard the Ventura County DA talking, and he talked a lot about light and dark. Did you think that that was helpful? Was it a good use of his time? It seems to me that you said this earlier, these county attorneys are using this as an opportunity for a platform. What do you think about his statement in particular? I think he was trying to juxtapose some of the facts of the case up against where he wants people to think of the case going forward. So talking about specific facts, such as the defendant being uh, akin to using uh, darkness to perpetrate his crimes, he would shut lights off, shut TVs off in uh, the houses uh, that he went into to attack people. And then he used that to, to uh, portray the defendant as just a dark, evil, almost evilly spiritual individual, and, and to characterize that uh, and juxtapose it up against uh, what he hoped the public would do going forward, and that is to think uh, kindly of uh, the victims and their families, to uh, encourage the families to show their love and remember the love that they had for the victims that they lost and, and those who survived and who are still suffering. So I, I think he was just using the old literary uh, technique to uh, create a foil between uh, one type of uh, event or situation or circumstance and another. Uh, and and it, it's memorable. It's something that we can remember. We can look back at the case and, and uh, think of it perhaps in those terms. Excellent, excellent analysis. A little esoterical for me, but you know, you're right. I think he was trying to make an analogy. Let's go back now and listen to the county attorney for Sacramento. She is now t taking her opportunity to say what she needs to say on behalf of the victims in her county. At night, ever. Gates on either side of our home are locked always. Lights surround our home. My close friends, all feel the same. Recently, a contractor in my home questioned why my sturdy, large, nailed picture window facing out hadn't been considered for replacement with, quote, nice sliders with screens to open out. I looked at the 40-something sternly, and I said my always ready answer. Three words. East area rapist. He made some comment about how he'd heard something about him, but he'd been, quote, arrested. I explained, you don't understand. I lived it. It will never go away. 
She goes on to say, while I was not a victim, I was a victim. On Monday, June 29th, I sat in front of my TV and I cried. I cried for the victims. I cried for the families. The horror, the terror of what those who died went through in their final moments. As a person of faith, I put my faith in God's love that he immediately covered those victims in peace and in love. I have to believe that in order to put my foot forward every day. Pam followed up with a note to me just a couple days ago. My heart, my being continues to weep for those victims. For the last week, our hearts and our beings have wept for each of his victims and their families. Their words and their stories will never be forgotten. As described by so many of the murder victim families and the crime victims, our society has been deprived of exceptional and extraordinary people. These rapes and these murders, in the words of our victims, have cut across families, friends, generations, and entire communities. In the words of Brian Sanchez, overwhelming grief is an understatement and true justice is an overstatement. Personally, I have faith that their souls have been covered in peace. and love. My greatest hope for all of these victims and their families perhaps is best put in their own words as we heard this week. The greatest revenge is to live your lives. Paint your children and your grandchildren's rooms again with hearts and rainbows. Water ski again. Leslie, as I listen to the Sacramento County prosecutor, Anne Marie Schubert, I am thinking that she took this very personally. And I'm wondering, have you had an experience where the case affects you personally, where you have trouble sleeping at night, thinking about the horrific crimes that you may be prosecuting? I've got to be honest with you, Terry. Um, uh, just about all of my cases um, were cases that I, that I took home. Every time I got a call in the middle of the night uh, to go to a homicide, uh, a homicide scene. Um, I've, I've never forgotten any of those, what those scenes look like. Any, I've never forgotten the screams of family members, of friends, of loved ones. Um, I've never forgotten how I've had to hear children tell me um, and relive over and over again uh, situations where someone they trusted had taken advantage of them um, sexually. And so, you know, whenever I would try a case, I tried to make sure that I could put um, some context, if you will, for the for for the jury so that they can understand that this isn't just a job for me. This is a responsibility so much to the point where um, I have um, sort of engulfed myself into these uh, into the experience um, of of the of the victims. And so I feel as though, this is what we're seeing here with um, all of the, uh, the, the prosecutors um, giving their statements, if you will, not just as victims, but as how it felt to have prosecuted such horrible crimes. Exactly. I can't even imagine being a prosecutor having to listen to what exactly happened, particularly in these types of cases. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will be live in the sentencing of Joseph D'Angelo out in California, the Golden State Killer.